meeting of the Dudley Charlton Regional School Committee is now in session. It is Wednesday, February 14th. It is 7 p.m. We're at the Shepherd Hill uh, High School Library. Let's all pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we're going to have a moment of silence for Patricia Baer, who passed away at a very young age. She served on the committee for 13 years, and she put her whole heart and soul into the committee. And Kathy and I knew her very well. We'll all have a moment of silence. Approval of the minutes. Um, this evening, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of our regular meeting of Wednesday, January 24th. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? Any discussion? Elaine, did you have any discussion? I wasn't here, so I'm abstaining. Okay. No. No. Okay. Seeing none, all in favor? Okay. Six one one abstain. I'll entertain a motion um, to approve um, the minutes of our special budget meeting that was held on Thursday, February eighth. So moved. So, okay. Discussion. I did um, prepare a correction. It was easier to prepare it than it was to say it. But on page three, paragraph three, um, I just wanted to reframe that. It's, it's um, regarding my comments regarding the um, budget. Did you want me to read them, Pauline, or is it just Go ahead. That's, uh, we Are have we it. Do you want? It would be okay. It's fine. Okay. It's We're fine. good? Yeah. All right. That's good. Do you, you have a copy? Okay. Any other discussion? No. So with uh, the corrections, <coughs> all in favor? Okay, and Joel and Stephanie were not here. <coughs> Two abstaining. Okay, approval of the warrant. This evening we do have a warrant. Citizens Forum, do we have anyone that would like to come forward to speak to us this evening? You can come up to the table and state your name and town. Uh, my name is Susan Smolsky. I live in Charlton. I have two kids in the school district. They're in fourth and sixth grade. Um, I was the library coordinator at Mason Road School for three years. Um, so the reason that I'm speaking up tonight is just to ask the committee about the four elementary school library positions that were cut. Um, I'd like to know if these jobs have made it into the fiscal year 19 budget, and if they haven't, um, what you'll be doing to get them reinstated. And I'm sitting here not as a past employee, but 100% as a parent, um, and also someone who truly believes that library services for elementary school kids is absolutely important. Do you want to address that? Well, all I can say right now is that in the initial budget, they are not in the plan at this time. Uh, of course, we all know from long experience that that does change as months go on. So uh, the door wouldn't be shut on that, but right now they're not in. And um, I also want to add while you're here that you did a wonderful job in your thank role. You. Thank, thank you for that. All right, well thank you thank for that you response, so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your remarks. Anyone else? Okay. Then we'll do the school spotlight, which is on Mason Road this evening. So, would you like to come up? Are we all set? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. 
Good evening. Thank you for having us here tonight. Come on, Marty, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Valentine wear. So I know they're looking forward to joining you tonight and showing you a little bit about what they've been learning in technology. So we are very excited to have added Mrs. Katrina Schmidt to our um, faculty at both Dudley L. and Mason Road. And she has jumped right aboard and um, has given a lot of strong support to our teachers through PD and through building-based um, design. So we're just really glad to have her aboard. And we thought, since technology is such a big part of what we're focusing on this year in the district, that it might be nice to see what that's all about and what that looks like through the eyes of a six-year-old. So at this time, I'm gonna let you come over here and I'm gonna let Mrs. Schmidt introduce each one of you. <laughs> right here we have Timmy Booth. These are all first graders at Mason Road School. We have Timmy Booth, Olivia Vivenzio, Emerson Fetish, Amelia Fiorulli, and Braden Trevolsky. And they are all going to show you today a little bit about how we um, learn about computer programming in first grade. And even in kindergarten, we do a little bit of it. So I am going to get the website <laughs> that we need to be on and then we can we can show you what we're what we're gonna be doing. <laughs> While Mrs. Schmidt is getting that ready for you, I want to tell you that right now she's currently hosting and teaching two robotics classes as part of our enrichment programs at Mason Road, and they are packed. If she could do it seven days a week, she would fill those classes. So they're learning all about B-Box in the robotics class. So, does that fill up time for you? It did. <laughs> you got a little glimpse of my website that I use with um, students to access the different things that we use. Yeah. It's a little loud, <laughs> but it'll do. Um, yeah, and so we have with us, we have the TV to kind of show everyone, but we also have iPads with the same activity on them that we're going to ask for some volunteers for. So, do you want to ask for volunteers, Amelia? There we go. We'll share one. Thank you. I'll give it a try, but don't don't have high expectations. We're going to be programming a little monster to move how we want it to go. Do you want to start? The mouse is right here. So explain what we need to do here. We're going to get the dragon 
of what command to the girl? Walk right. To drag the walk command up. And then she gets <laughs> Click on the girl. And then she gets set. So we gave her the program. You mean the detective? Oh, wait, the boy should be dragging. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you guys can help, help your friends with the iPads. They okay, might you do it. You know better than me. Oh, we got three stars already. We did good. So you want to come up to new level? Yeah. Sarah? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we need you. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so you we go like this. <laughs> and then what do you do? Oh, tap the girl. We would tap the donut. And then you the donut. Oh, okay. We would give them, we were hitting the donut instead. Thank you. Now just hit this. Awesome. Now it's level two already. What that was fast, huh? Nope. It's easy because you know what to do with it. <laughs> now we're going to do this one. So Timmy said we're going to drag the walk command to the two squares and then click on the police officer. Okay. It is. You can face it. There you go. Do I do like that? Or do I just... We have to take a second. Oh, you have two different ones. Now I hit. So we just so go Thank you. Helped us out both times. And now we get this. So Olivia, can you explain that new command that we just saw <laughs> to our audience? The jump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, just like the working again. This is yeah, you have to down 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 down. Down. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. So what command, what program do you need to give the police officer here, Olivia? Walk and then jump. Uh-oh. Yeah. Do the walk and then the jump. And then hit the man. You always have to hit him last, huh? Okay, he's, uh, and then he's got to jump over the Now we go forward Now we have a pattern. Can you tell us what the pattern is? Walk, jump, walk, jump. Okay, walk, jump, walk, jump. Isn't that going that way? Yes. How are you doing? Walk, jump, walk, jump. Oh, you're getting good. Now, you're getting good. Now, you're getting good. Now, he said we're going to be programming the police officer to walk right, jump right, jump right. And he's going to jump first. Yeah, but how we go on the right way? Oh, no. Walk, jump, 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 Thank you. Yeah. 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 Algorithms, so instructions that we give a computer. They're learning about when they said when they talked about the pattern that they noticed. That's another computer science concept of loops that they're learning about. Um, so they're learning in these really basic game-based ways that are very high interest, um, but still instill those computer science principles, um, which is really strong and a, a good thing to learn, especially when they're young, so that they have it when they get into those older, older grades. Thank you. Wonderful right, job. Thank you. Thank you.
Matilde Martini that came over from Italy and spent oh, yeah, a year sure. with us. Um, at, I, was, I was just <coughs> communicating with her family and um, interestingly enough because of her participation on the Shepherd Hill wrestling team she is now doing mixed martial arts over in Italy. Oh, wow. Wow. So they wanted us to know this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Oh, that's no, they good. think it's wonderful. <laughs> She is a brave girl. She is. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Superintendent's report, Mr. Desta. Thank you, Mrs. O'Coin. Uh, just begin by giving a, an update to the committee on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's targeted district review, which Mrs. <coughs> Allen and I have uh, been making you aware of for the past um, few months. So for the past three days, the despite it being the week before vacation and today Valentine's Day, and the 100th day I think was Monday, so very active time uh, to be visiting the schools, but the, the team from the DESE uh, has been in, was in the district interviewing staff, parents, community leaders, and school committee members. Um, they observed 61 classes throughout, throughout uh, pre-K to grade 12 and reviewed uh, more documents than I can count. So today, uh, Mrs. Allen and I had our final debrief meeting with the team, and we heard some some really uh, some things that really made us feel good. Um, <coughs> particularly, uh, I'll just say that I, it's always good when somebody from the outside uh, comes in and says, "How have I never heard of this place?" <laughs> I just think that that's a nice uh, compliment for us. And, and two of the things that really mean a lot to me: one. The cultures of our schools, they walk in, they feel positive, they say the adults are enormously cooperative and friendly. Um, mostly, though, today, they were just head over heels about the behavior of our students. Now, I, I know that young people are never perfect. They said that our kids were as well behaved as any they've seen and, and as respectful, holding doors. And uh, So again, while I don't mean to paint a picture of a place that's uh, utopia, I was very, very proud to hear that and to be the superintendent of a district where uh, a team from the Department of Education will be going away saying such good things about our, our, our grown-ups and our kids. Um, so now it'll be um, in about 10 to 12 weeks we'll, re we'll receive a draft of their report and then we'll have a very short time of uh, period for review and rebuttal and then the final report is generated and posted on the department website. Uh, and of course, the, uh, it, I will share that with the school committee and the administrative team will, will certainly look at that as an opportunity to see where we can grow. And I, I do want to send a public thank you to all the community members, to Mrs. Kabbalah, to our staff and students and administrators, and, and most of all to Mrs. Allen, who uh, put in a ridiculous amount of time and effective planning uh, in this process. I want to thank everybody who, who helped make it as smooth as it could possibly be. Uh, I'm gonna, I've got something about the basketball, but I'm going to wait till Rebecca speaks because I think Rebecca and I sometimes have the same good news to report. I'm going to let Rebecca <laughs> report on that. Um, if I could, Mrs. O'Coin, I'd like to ask Mrs. Ayres to join us briefly at the table to give some enormously good news uh, to the school committee. Well, then come on up. <laughs> you could use some of that. Yes. Huh? Pass one of those around to everybody. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so that's good. I'm the bearer of good news. So Mr. Desto spoke a couple weeks ago um, about us applying for a second round of Project Lead the Way grants for our middle schools uh, for some STEM programming. And I'm excited to um, announce tonight that we have received um, grants for both our middle schools um, for $30,000 for each school. Grants group. Um, the, they're two-year grants, and the money will be paid similar to the uh, <coughs> Shepherd Hill grant that we received last year that we um, are for, uh, it's for Principles of Biomedical Science program. Um, it's a two-year grant, and it can be used for materials, to purchase materials and equipment for the modules that we're going to implement, um, which you have all there, the modules that we <coughs> hope to implement in the years, because it's going to be a gradual phase in approach. Um, so the next year we're going to implement, hopefully, um, design and modeling in grade six, and grade seven, automation and robotics. <coughs> the following year, science and of technology, in grade seven and in grade eight app creators and the following year after that um, computer science for innovators and makers the way in which we approach this um, this phased in approach was with the grant funding uh, some of those courses require more equipment like the robotics and the app makers class so we can use a lot of the funding for those materials so um, we're very excited about that and I'd like to thank um, the principals of both schools for all their hard work um, that they helped with um, assistance. So, Is it $30,000 for the two years or 30 yep. each year? Um, it's going to be $18,000 next oh. year and 12000 the year Time. after that. So per school. Per school. Per school. Yeah, so $16,000 yeah. total. And so we, uh, along with that also comes um, teacher professional development. So the teachers will be trained this summer at WPI in the modules that they'll be teaching. So. Oh, that's, that's great. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. So now we have it at all three of our secondary schools. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Mrs. Harris will be being a little humble, but we have to thank you for your hard work on this. Uh, Mr. Starshevsky and Mr. Packard, as, as Mrs. Harris said, uh, you, they all did it. What high, middle school did you visit? Stoneham Middle School. Stoneham Middle School, who has this project running currently took a look at it, decided that yes, we do think that this is something we'd want to do, and uh, it took a lot of time, and we really appreciate it. It's good to see that pay off, and I think it's going to be right in line with our strategic plan and the direction we want to go, and we <coughs> probably couldn't have afforded it otherwise, so good stuff. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Quick question. Thank you. Do you see, after they're making this type of investment in us, do you see that going to be trending to keep that going since... Well, that's part of why we were such a strong applicant because we did we brought it to the high school last year. They really want to, you know, encourage the programs at the schools. So, yes. Anything we can do to, keep, <laughs> to help you keep that going, or um, just budget? <laughs> <laughs> keep the money flowing. Yeah, exactly. Anything else? Actually. Yeah. <laughs> Something a little easier. <laughs> um, go ahead. Question: Do they have grants that go down to the uh, they upper do. elementary as yeah. well? Yep. So maybe next year we can no, get yeah. started even a little lower. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and if, I also wanted to uh, just say a few words about our Women in STEM Night that we're preparing. And since I know a little less about it than <laughs> Mrs. Harris, and she's already at the table, uh, it might make more sense for her to explain. It. But I, I'm really excited. I think this is not that I'm a woman or anything, but I really think <laughs> this is going to be a great event. I truly do. Have you heard about it, Rebecca? Uh, I've heard of Girls Who Code before. Okay, good. That's so a good start. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, with that, um, uh, myself and the Dudley Women's Club have um, come together to promote a Women in STEM night, reached out to various uh, companies in the community, which are all in the flyer that you should have received in your packet. Um, and basically, you know, kind of starting to have some exposure to our girls in grades five through 12 about the opportunities that lie out there in the STEM fields. Um, we're gonna have a panel of keynote speakers um, from Montfrey Insurance and the IT kind of world and their, their Women's Leadership Network and also uh, Carl Storrs, Women's Engineers uh, from their Women's Leadership Panel. Um, and then there'll be a career expo where, you know, the girls can go around and talk to the different um, women and learn about their different careers. There's architects, veterinary, 
um, there'll be a veterinary clinic, there'll be nurses, <coughs> a paramedic, you know, optics engineers, there'll be video game designers from Becker. Um, so we're, I'm excited about it. Um, so we're trying to get the word out there um, through email, through social media. Um, you know, hopefully our teachers can spread the word in their classrooms as well, and you can spread it in through your community uh, as well. So, yeah, sure. I hope to see you there. <laughs> and this, there's a copy of the flyer in, the, in your package. <coughs> Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Nash. Thank you. And the last thing that I have for the committee is just a very brief update on our statement of interest for the roof at Shepherd Hill. The statement of interest is complete. Mr. Chaplin and I, and along with some help from Mrs. Sullivan, have looked it over. Uh, ad nauseum at this point. <laughs> we've, uh, we've read it over and over and over. And so all that remains now is our uh, completing the electronic signature portion. And we have to send it in electronically and a hard copy with a, with a copy of the minutes where we voted the, uh, where you voted the authorization to go for the SOI. So uh, it'll be out by no later than uh, Friday morning. And <coughs> we'll just wait and see. And uh, that's pretty much all I have. Is that around Christmas again? Like, is it always the same? Well, the regular one is. <coughs> this one here, I think, comes that we get notification a little bit sooner. Um, it's a little bit less involved. You actually, what I didn't realize, you actually submit um, an entire document, but you have only one priority. Pri it's called priority five, which is the roof or the boilers, but we're doing the roof. Um, the, the other one, you check every box for every priority. So the focus for them now is only on one right. section. But we, re we still submitted all the other things, too. Just that's part of the process. Okay. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Student representative report, Rebecca. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, hi. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with what Mr. Desto brought up earlier about the basketball game last night. So, Shepherd Hill Boys Varsity Basketball competed against Lemonster last night. It was a home game where senior Jason O'Riggins scored his 1,000th point which is a very big milestone in his career, so congrats to him and his family. He's gonna go far in basketball, I'm sure. <laughs> and the girls track team got approved last night to go to New York City for their like international track meet. I think that's what it is, national, international. I think it's national, <laughs> that makes more sense. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Um, they got they got approved to go there, which is really great because they've been really they've been I think undefeated I don't know something like that or I assume so they're really good um, and the last thing is uh, Dudley Middle School Prestige um, Show Choir has gone undefeated so far in their season, which I think is really great because. If you look back on the history of like show choir, every year the students from like middle school to high school always improve, and it's so great to see how the t like how much talent each student has at such a young age, from like ten to fourteen to like high school level. So <coughs> it's really great. So I'm gonna congrats congratulate them, and Absolutely. that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you. Thank I you. might add to Rebecca's report, particularly starting with the music program, <coughs> that our upperclassmen here at the high school are a big part of the success of the middle school because, they, like I said before, they go down and they, they serve as role models, they, they train, they, they work with the students for, for no pay, as far as, not that I'm aware of anyway. <laughs> um, but our middle schools, both of them, they might be the best in, like, in New England. I'm not aware of any better middle schools that we've competed against. And of course, our high school is right there as well. They, they have more competition because more places have high school show choir. But it's just an outstanding, outstanding program. I want to go back to uh, basketball. And you referenced uh, Jason O'Regan, who I want to also um, add. I've, I've known since he was a little kid. And he's as good a student in person as he is a player. And we're really proud of him. It's a tremendous milestone. And to give you some some uh, perspective on a thousand points. He has he scored 997 points more than I did in my high school. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That three one three-pointer I hit in garbage <laughs> time my junior year. Uh, but I also want to add a, a team thing to this, and that is that uh, our varsity basketball teams here at Shepherd Hill are finishing up the regular season this year, and right now their record is a combined 31 and eight. Wow. They're really both having excellent seasons, yeah. so we're really proud of them. They've worked very hard, and they represent us very well. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. That brings us to new business, FY 2019 budget, one presentation, part two. 
and two, Proposition two and a half, override update. Mr. Desco. Thank you, Mrs. O'Coin. So we have a kind of an awkward setup here. We're gonna to try to figure out how best to do this, but we have a... <coughs> Mr. Matthew and I are going to team up on this. Is the mouse over there somewhere? Yes, it yes. is. Okay. I guess I'll just stand right here, and it's a little bit awkward. I apologize, but... Um, okay. So, the last meeting, as just about everybody here is aware, I presented what the educational priorities of the district would be, and, and some of those are also included in here. Um, but this tonight is largely about the numbers, and so uh, Mr. Matthew and I will team on this. Just as a beginning point, our budget goals are very similar to <coughs> the previous two years with some subtle changes. Always want to ensure the safety and security of our students first. I think we got another uh, reminder of that. I hate to talk about negative things, but there was, there was a terrible news story out of Florida today uh, with another school shooting, and it's, uh, there's been varying reports of the number of school shootings that there have been between January 1st and today, just that, that month and a half span of time, like 12 or 15 in America already, just in that span of time. And we always have to be um, on our guard as far as safety and security, not just about school shootings, but about all kinds of different uh, things related to safety. We, um, we also, as a district, have to address recurring operational funding concerns. We know that every year we have a one point anywhere between a million and $1.5 million increase. If we have some bad luck, it could be even higher than that. That's just a fixed cost increase that we have to cover each year just to open the doors. Um, then to uh, some of our strategic planning objectives, like our social, emotional, mental health support that we need to increase in our schools, progress toward our strategic planning objectives, including STEAM, project-based learning, global awareness, an integration of technology across grades and subjects, not just in technology class, but in all subjects. We're trying still to reduce class size, maintain extracurricular opportunities that we're so proud of and that have become a, a staple of, of Dudley Charlton. Always must meet our contractual and health insurance obligations and provide <coughs> necessary funding for those mandates that we get, some funded and some not. This year, the following positions as of the initial budget are what we are requesting up front. Uh, we're looking at two adjustment counselors. Uh, there would be one, uh, one on the Charlton side of the district and one on the Dudley side uh, that would split their time between the elementary schools. And we're looking at two technology integration specialists, also one in each town to split time between each elementary school. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Matthew for some, some numbers at this time. <coughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Desto gets to do the uh, fun and exciting stuff, and I get to do the boring numbers. Um, <laughs> but since that's my job, I guess it's not that bad. But, um, as you can see, uh, we are slated for an increase in Chapter 70 um, on the per pupil allocation um, granted by the governor. Additionally, we are looking at a, a $20,000 increase uh, in transportation revenue from the state. Um, still short of their uh, desired 100 or promised 100% reimbursement to regional districts uh, <coughs> such as ourselves. And uh, the final year of our school construction debt uh, is FY19, uh, I think which is good news, um, and this will be the final payment there. And as you can see, uh, total state aid is slated to increase by $95,160. Um, that's, that's great and, and you know, it's. It's good that the state can provide additional funds um, as we go forward. But as Mr. Desto has already alluded to, uh, having a million dollar um, basic need um, in, a, in a $50 million budget e each and every year, uh, 95,000 is a good start, but that's all it is. It's a, a good start. The uh, funding assessments uh, break down for FY19 um, Again, with the, with the increase for Charlton and Dudley um, at a combined three million oh eighty seven, um, the excess um, from what's required, and, and that's where this district had been a, a decade or so ago, um, pretty close to the minimum required, is over two million dollars. So we're certainly making progress. We're, we're still, even with these increases, um, 
I don't know where we'll end up with it in the FY19 per pupil expenditure um, rankings, but this will help us, uh, I think, increase there. Uh, in FY18, uh, the minimums for the two towns uh, were about $1 million, so we are <coughs> a substantial increase there. Um, as the committee and um, the community members uh, are aware, the state has been shifting the burden to uh, the towns. Uh, Charlton is now above its tar target share, its second year, um, but unfortunately Dudley still does remain below. Um, Charlton above the target share by $20,000. Uh, Dudley is still 5.29% below its target share, um, slightly over a million dollars. Uh, for FY19, uh, these values were computed on the property values for, based on 2016 and the income wealth based on 2015 uh, information. Uh, these shares fluctuate each year, um, and it, as the uh, Department of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education uh, revises their numbers, uh, sometimes the assessments even change. I'll, I'll remind the committee that we had a change in July <coughs> of last year not only with a decrease in transportation revenue, uh, but a change in assessments as well. Uh, funding from, from all sources um, that support the, the general fund budget. Uh, as indicated, the state aid is up by 95,000. Uh, town assessments uh, over $3 million, um, ideally. Uh, district reserves, uh, we are recommending committing uh, an additional 142,000, um, specifically to cover the um, unexpected increase in state assessments for school choice and um, charter school uh, students leaving the district. Um, transportation revolving, um, I'll remind the, the committee and uh, community members that, that that's where uh, the regional school can uh, put any revenues received for transportation in excess of, of its budget, uh, provided that it used use those monies to support the transportation budget either the next year or for the following year budget. Uh, because of the increase last year, the $30,000 that we had hoped that we'd be able to put towards the FY19 budget was reduced down to $9,494. And the capital reserves and the donations um, helped to offset the field project. Um, and uh, that's going to continue for a few more years. Um, the premiums from the bonds, um, decrease each and every year, so that's why the, the small decrease there. For FY19, um, the estimated additional revenues, additional expenses that the district uh, will have above and beyond its general fund are listed here. Uh, we anticipate um, at this point uh, in the process utilizing 886,000 of circuit breaker, uh, 987,000 of school choice, um, 105,000 from athletic fees, um, our cafeteria has a, about a million dollar expense each and every year. Um, in FY18, we're slated to receive 1.37 million um, of federal and state grants, uh, and that number carries forward. The budget does include an offset of 133,000 for E-rate, which is um, specifically um, generated from our internet uh, usage, and that's reimbursed <coughs> from the uh, federal government for that. Uh, we do offset the budget by the preschool tuition that we charge, and um, if necessary, we also have the parking fees, um, which we generate each and every year, that uh, could help offset any unexpected um, expenses, or ideally be saved to help pay the parking fees uh, in the future when necessary. The uh, proposed revenue here uh, is just a quick breakdown between Charlton, Dudley, the state, and uh, our reserves. The state share has been declining each and every year, um, and as you'll see in, in the budget message inside of the budget books, and the, uh, which will be posted on the website as well, um, in the past 12 years, the share of the district budget that the state picks up has decreased from basically 60% down to 50%. A quick breakdown of the budget summary. Um, the operating budget um, is coming in at 48, 465, 049 with the capital uh, for a total expense budget of 53155649 uh, included in there, and the reason for the jump in the capital is um, a proposed uh, capital project to rewire the four elementary schools and two middle schools uh, for the network cabling. Uh, that's a, a million dollar uh, project uh, for which uh, we would 
expect to receive about 230,000 of the rate reimbursement. Um, we don't know exactly when that will hit, um, but that would be the the timing of that would, would uh, dictate how those funds are used and, and when those funds are used. Um, but ideally, they would be used to support technology in some form or fashion, whether it's um, the backbone uh, and switches and those sorts of things, or uh, actual devices. And then uh, just a breakdown of, of the specific revenues um, and, and the sources here. Um, the total town assessments, uh, again, come in at 23 million. 296.062 combined. A quick breakdown of, of how these expenses um, break out between salary and, and employee benefits, um, transportation, special education and state assessments, maintenance and utilities of the buildings, technology, supplies, textbooks, uh, general expenses, and uh, the debt uh, for the district. Again, uh, it's very good news, I think, that the FY19 is the final year of the uh, debt payment for the middle schools, and, uh, and um, something that the committee does need to um, discuss and bring forward uh, as we go forward through this budget process, uh, um, because we will ideally have uh, a roof here at Shepherd Hill to replace with the state kicking in a, uh, their fair share uh, of those numbers. Um, so we'll, we'll need to be in a position to uh, be able to bring something forward for, for that. I'll turn it back over to Mr. Desto to uh, walk through the fun stuff. Right. I don't know if anybody has any specific questions on the numbers themselves. I'd like to reiterate something that Mr. Matthew said because I think it's really important and it bears repeating. Over the past 12 years, the burden of funding for our district has shifted 10% from the state to the town. You know, all along, everybody in this room has been hearing, well, the, the burden is shifting because of the new formula. And that's the, net, that's the result of that. So what, what is, you think what's 10% of our budget is $5 million. And that's been approximately the shift in 12 years from the state to the towns. And so it really is, um, I think the actions that we're taking this year are absolutely necessary and appropriate. Um, quickly, <clears throat> budget legislative next steps, in case anybody's wondering, same as usual. And uh, verified these with our legislators recently. House of Representatives uh, budget, we will expect sometime around the end of April. We'll hear some rumors before that, but we won't have anything definitive until then. The Senate Ways and Means uh, report could come out as early as mid-May, but the final Senate budget is around the beginning of June. Then the conference budget is also in June, and the governor takes any action that he has to take in response to those things in June as well. It's a very difficult process for school districts because we get a lot of information late in the game and we have to make decisions much sooner than that. I'm going to say this every year that I'm fortunate enough to stay in this position, our tradition of success. I sometimes look at these numbers, and I'm sure you've done the same, and say to yourself, how have we done this? And we've done it because of a lot of the people in this room and a lot of other people through the years. We've had great people for many years. Our students and families are outstanding. Our administrators, faculty, staff, community, town, school committee, we don't outspend almost anybody. But we do have extraordinary, extraordinarily professional, caring, and hardworking people. And so if anybody's listening, if anybody's watching, I want to make sure that I say thank you to those people because they're the reason that we've been able to do this on the budget that we have. Now we get into something that I think is is pretty interesting, and that is, I'll admit I'm not as cool as I used to be, but I think this is interesting. <laughs> um, the most recent per pupil expenditures, which the, the most recent reports we have are from FY16, and <coughs> as you can see, our expenditure per pupil is 11750 and the state average is approximately 15511 Of course, that changes a little bit every year. Um, under these numbers, it would cost an additional $14.2 million for our district annually to reach the state average. And of course, it all adds up to us having uh, one of the lowest per pupil expenditures in the state, fifth from the bottom in the state, bottom 1.5%, and last out of all 69 regional school districts. Bottom, no percent needed, just bottom. Um, Rich and I talked about this. The ranking itself doesn't matter, but access to adequate resources does. This is tough to read. The, the letters are small, but um, 
you can see the, the per pupils starting up at the top, and we're down at the bottom. This is what I want to point out today. Last night, the Board of Selectmen <coughs> approved a special election for April 3rd for an override. The override is for approximately $1.5 million in each of our towns. The Dudley Selectmen will take this up on uh, February 26th, and we do believe that they're going to approve it as well, though I don't want to put the cart before the horse. We're grateful to them for that support. I want to be clear on this. <coughs> if my calculations are correct, a, a $3 million, approximately $3 million override would add about $700 per pupil to our per pupil expenditure. That would still keep us below, it would put us ahead of Wachusett and Douglas if these numbers all stayed the same, but it would still keep us below Lester and Quaybon and Sutton and everybody else above. So we would now be third from the bottom instead of the bottom. So it, it's not like this would be a windfall. And it, we're, I, I wrote this down yesterday. We're, this would not put us among the Wellesleys and the Brooklines or even the Auburns and the Sturbridges. It just puts us, it, makes, it helps us be able to compete is all it does. It helps us to be able to put our kids in a position to continue to compete. So looking to the future, we still have a variety of challenges that we have to face. Don't I know it? I won't read through the whole thing because I know that you can read. Still somehow we have to keep going forward. Possible solutions, the very top of the list is our Proposition 2.5 override. This would be a, a great step forward for our district. Um, there's always the possibility of increased revenue from the state, although I know no one in this room is going to hold their breath on that. And then you can see some of the other possibilities. And then to our schedule. Tonight is the initial budget vote of the school committee. February 26th is the deadline for the Dudley selectmen to vote on our override election. Once they do so, then as the kids say, it's on like Donkey Kong. March 14th, school committee meeting, public hearing, on our, and that was quoted in our regional agreement as the final budget, although we don't believe that it will be. Then April 3rd are, is the date for our special election, and then the town meetings are the 14th and the 21st. And at this point, it would be appropriate for questions and discussion. Thank you for your patience. I would appreciate that and then maybe take the override issue separately. Okay. So I have the figures and I will entertain a motion after I read the figures um, to approve this budget that we have in front of us. And uh, the total expenses, the bottom line is $53,155,649. The assessment to the towns and the town of Charlton, the assessment will be $13,902,746. And for Dudley, um, the net assessment will be $9,393,316. It gives the total of Charlton and Dudley assessments $23,000,000. $296,062. And those are the figures we're voting on this evening. I'll entertain a motion to approve these figures that I've read. So moved. Second. Discussion? Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion carries. It's unanimous. We have a budget this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and you wanted to take up the proposition two and a half override? Yes, just a, a few things I, I'd like to say uh, related to that and a couple of uh, questions that I, I think I'd like to generate just a little bit of discussion at the table um, related to a few aspects of an override. Uh, first, I want to 
thank publicly the Charlton Board of Selectmen for unanimously approving our request for a special override election on April 3rd. Uh, Mrs. Rather and I attended the meeting last night and I was just uh, truly, truly grateful for the, the positivity and the support. Uh, the selectmen had many kind words for the school committee and your diligence and, and how the job that you've done over the years with uh, of making the school district so great on a shoestring budget. So. Um, each, each member of the selectmen was very clear that this is necessary uh, for our towns and for our schools, and so I want to thank them. Um, I look forward to the 26th when the, when the Dudley selectmen take up the question as well, and we've had positive communications with them, and, and we hope that for a positive result there too. But a few items that I would like to um, ask for the committee's help with tonight are as follows. The first thing is, um, attendance at meetings and you probably know this already but this is uh, relatively new to me I'm going to try to attend every selectman meeting uh, between now and April 3rd if at all possible but I do know that there may be a time when I might run into some conflict so I'd like to suggest subject to the committee's input that we make an effort that we're at least represented uh, at every meeting and it is very possible that Mr. Matthew and I together we can cover every single meeting uh, but if not I want to make sure that it's okay that I'll be able to reach out and, and uh, and ask you to cover for me, so to speak, because we're the ones who know the answers to the questions. Um, and I expect that there will be some questions at each meeting. The second one, speaking of questions, is that I would like to, as a committee, as a group, <coughs> provide a document to the community that answers as many frequently asked questions as, pro as possible about the budget. Um, as you hear questions that you, uh, you think are starting to become more and more frequent, more and more common, I would ask that you please just let me know. I, if, you know, if you, there are questions sometimes that come out of left field, but a lot of times you start to develop themes. And as those themes develop, um, you know, please let me know so I can put together that document as accurately as I possibly can, and we can answer as many questions as we can right from the start. Uh, certainly, if anyone had any tonight, I, we could start the process here, but if not, you can just email me or call me or whatever. And finally, um, along the same vein, I, I would like, and in fact, I've been asked to provide our town officials with a list of short but important talking points uh, for when approached by the community. And I'm envisioning something small and portable, perhaps like um, you know the Red Sox schedule that that, that, that we get. I, I don't want to start, they, but they're having their first workout today, so I just wanted to work that in somehow. Um, Something that can go with us wherever we go, and again, the committee's input on those talking points would be valuable, so if there are particular things that you think are important that you know, we should be sharing when people approach us, or even, you know, even if they don't approach us, then um, you know, please let me know as I try to put together a document. These, by the way, none of these things will be in any way uh, pushing for any kind of a vote. I'm just talking about informing people about our budget process, about where we are as a district, what we want to do, what we want to accomplish, and so on and so forth. So I'd like to start, uh, certainly without question, by that meeting on the 26th um, with the selectmen. I'd like to be a little ways down the road on those things. Okay. And then next steps. I want to get the committee's input on, on next steps. Um, just thinking about the, the group that we had that worked together in the fall, which included Mrs. O'Coin, Mr. Chalk, and the chair and co-chair of all of the town boards. Is it necessary at this point to put that group back together, or has that work been essentially done now because we have a number and we have a, an election coming, and now we need to look at something different at this point? Just, just hoping for some input on that. I think it's a school issue now. I think the, their work is done. It's okay. over the ballot. I think we're the ones that should know most about what's going on. Okay. I don't see I mean, that whole committee back together. Okay. I don't know. Just a, a comment, Mr. Desto, um, in looking at attending town meetings, I would suggest that we also put the finance board on our meeting as they start to go through their budget process. They actually put the numbers together and make right. recommendations to the board of selectmen, so I think we should be yeah. looking to attend those as well. Okay. So I'll reach out to the um, town administrators and try to uh, try to get as much in advance schedule as I can. Uh, I know in, in Dudley the finance committee meets kind of um, 
I'll use the expression as needed. It's not as needed. They meet monthly, but they, they're not, it's always a TBA. So um, I'll do the best I can to get a schedule. And like I said, Mr. Matthew and I won't be able to cover almost all of it, but um, we'll see how it goes. So what about a, you know, a public budget forum where we welcome the community in and we, I don't, that would probably bore people, something like that, but something more along the lines of general points about our budget, about our budget history, and about what we want to do as a district moving forward. Um, we haven't had good success with getting big crowds, but I, I want to just start talking about some ideas for how to inform people about where we are as a well, district. you want to make a video for the, the, I mean, <coughs> for the website? Could do that. Because people don't come to meetings, really. I know. Yeah. And the ones that come are the ones that would support you anyways, usually. It's the ones that you don't come, that right. you want to reach. So videos, so uh, social media, those I kind of things. Think that's well. to go nowadays. Can I make a suggestion? And um, the suggestion would be is if we were to provide a form on our website for people to submit questions to us and perhaps on our agenda for the next couple of meetings, you could have in communications of answering mm -hmm. questions presented by the community. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I, I don't know that, I don't know if the questions could be done in a nan and with and and without names. <laughs> Thank you. Just in the context of we're, we're looking to answer questions, and I know we're, we're very concerned about not um, doing anything to sway public opinion. We're trying to present neutral information, but um, I agree with Mrs. Caballo that it's very difficult for a lot of people to come out at night, and I just want to compliment the number of people that are here on Valentine's Day oh night no, for this meeting. All of our administration, obviously, are part of very secure relationships <laughs> and they're here on Valentine's Day night. Your spouses night. knew what they were getting into exactly. when they married school administrators. Exactly, but you know, I, I, I believe that we should, um, I know on our agenda we do say Citizens Forum, but I think we should identify perhaps a place of we will be answering budget questions here. If you have questions about, uh, again, Mrs. Smolsky coming in and making a specific question to our budget there, and then collect questions and be able to answer them at those times, I think sure. would be helpful. Yeah, we, Rich brought that to my attention today that we probably do have the ability to do that through our website provider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then certainly through social media, we can promote the idea that, and with a link to the page, um, absolutely good idea. I have one more comment, and I think, I, I know you're going to prepare fact sheets, um, but um, these are comments that come from <coughs> having attended the Mars meeting um, this week on Tuesday, and there were two presentations on Chapter 7 funding from DESE and, and uh, Mass Budget and Policy. But there's two things that I think are, are important to point out that we hear when we're talking about budgets, and one of them is the term of adequate because the number that the state puts together for per pupil expenditure comes with this word of adequate, and I think that that's a kind of a misnomer. It's not really adequate. It's basically considered the baseline. You don't want to go below that. So when we hear the term adequate, people think that the number that comes out as the base assessment should be sufficient to do everything that we need to do, and I think, um, I think we've created a lot of miracles over the last five or six years. Um, and there are no more miracles left. But the other thing that um, I would really want to comment on, and I think where most people in the public that aren't in, in the um, con you know, constant conversation regarding budgets is we constantly hear the state is shifting the funding to the towns. And I would like to make sure that people understand that the state is never going to take back that responsibility. So when we say the state is shifting to the towns, that's permanent. It's not ever going to get better and it's not ever going to be less of a demand. So I think that, you know, there were several advocacy groups at the Mars meeting regarding fu funding for regional school districts and I, you know, um, there's some great advocacy movements out there but the Shifting to town responsibility for education funding is only going to continue to grow. It's not going to lessen, and I think that's an important point that we need to make when we're talking about this. Yes, and, and that segues into the idea that, you know, we're 
we're taking this on mm -hmm. with support from our towns that we do appreciate. But this is absolutely every bit for all of us, not just for the school system. It's all of us together. Um, it's an investment in the future of the communities. You know, we believe, I believe, I know you all do too, that the children are the number one resource. Um, but, you know, without some plan in place, our, our towns will struggle too. And so, because you're absolutely right, there's no cavalry coming from the state. It's the burden is here now, and it's not going away. That's all I have on that. I, I appreciate the Any, input. Anyone else before we go on? I just want to comment a couple of articles in the paper recently. Was, so, well, Gazette could have gave the facts exactly as it was presented. And I think people can now see what the text, because up to this point, it's been kind of quiet. Yeah. But those articles brought attention to us. So yeah. I hope that they'll be more to follow. <laughs> <laughs> well done. No, they were, they were right on target. Yeah. You almost never read an article when, when you're involved, when you don't say, oh, I wish it was. Yeah. But I thought it was very well done. Yeah. Very fair. Okay, we're moving on <coughs> to um, Director of Finance and Operations report, Mr. Matthew. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of uh, light items <coughs> after a uh, $53 million budget presentation. Um, the district has received uh, a number of donations um, included in your memo. Uh, the Dudley's, Dudley Women's Club has donated $200 for the aforementioned um, district's Women in STEM Night uh, to be held March 13th um, here at Shepherd Hill. Uh, the Charlton Middle School has received a donation of $200 uh, for the upkeep of uh, the defibrillators in the school. Uh, the Heritage School has received a donation of $100 from the Fresh Kicks uh, Dance uh, Company. The Dudley Charlton Education Foundation has donated $500 to the district for the 2018 District Art Show. The Charlton Elementary School has received a donation of $1,500 to replace um, restroom partitions in the first floor um, boys' rooms. And the Dudley Elementary School has received a donation uh, from Box Tops in the amount of $969.90. Additionally, the uh, Dudley Middle School has received a donation of $75 um, to support student uh, meal account deficits and uh, another anonymous donation in the amount of $2,000 to be used in the following manner. $1,000 for the Dudley Middle School Ski Club, $300 to support student meal uh, account deficits for breakfast, and $700 uh, for the same to support deficits, uh, student meal de account great. deficits for lunch. And that was done anonymous, yes. anonymously. Very good. So um, we'll take them all together, seeing that you read all of them. So we'll take them in one motion. Uh, I'll entertain um, a motion to approve all the donations stated by Mr. Matthew. So moved. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion carries. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, on to actually a, a, a weighty issue. Um, the uh, district's uh, transportation contract expires at the end of this year, as the committee is aware. Um, we did conduct a procurement and open bids on February 7th. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that the pricing uh, did come in uh, at about a 5% increase, um, a lower than we were anticipating. Um, our only bidder uh, was for a student, um, so it looks like we probably will be continuing that relationship uh, depending on the uh, school committee's um, vote. The, right now, the total budget increase um, for the uh, daily bus service uh, is 173000 I did request from them that they um, include in that pricing uh, the first parent app, um, which would provide notification to parents. Uh, the cost of that was estimated at 17000 or bid at 17000 for the first year, including setup costs, and uh, 12 for 20 for subsequent years. Uh, I did speak with the area manager today, and they're able to, to remove the, the setup costs, which are essentially $5,000, um, but they are not able to include the, um, the full app inside of the pricing. I will say this, uh, there was the, the president slash owner of a local transportation company um, and at the bid opening, and he was very clear in his comments that um, the bid we received was uh, under market. 
So the first, the first student, I, I, I do thank them. They did step up to the plate mm -hmm. to, to help us out uh, and to keep our business, which was a great thing. Um, I recommend that the school committee accept the bid um, as is. Um, whether or not we, we want to uh, pursue the, the parent app, um, we, we can discuss, and um, we don't need to necessarily approve that today, but I will say um, one of the things that would be required in order to make that happen um, is uh, for the district to invest in uh, routing tra uh, transportation software <coughs> uh, that would feed the, the, the first parent app. Mm -hmm. The estimated cost of that is about five thousand uh, dollars, coincidentally enough. Um, so, again, we can we can discuss that at a at a future meeting uh, in terms of whether or not uh, we think it's advantageous. My opinion, um, at, for for twelve thousand dollars a year, it's a great uh, notification tool. Um, so, I think there is a plus plus to it. That's for sure. So, was that part of the bid? To we we bid it. We bid it as an optional package. So you can go back and take it. Are you, you we we, we can. It? We, we don't. We don't have to accept it. It's you not part of the base price. Again, like so no. it's not included in this vote that amount. I, I would recommend that we discuss that separately. Okay. All right. So we're approving the the bid as is, um, without the uh, first parent app to first student. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Okay. Do second. I have a second? Second. Discussion. Can, Eli, we, can we put the topic of first um, of the first parent app on the next budget and finance subcommittee meeting? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Motion carries. It's unanimous. Could you just explain for the general public what that is? Because I think we know, but I'm not sure if everybody knows. What the that first is. parent app. Yeah. Um, basically, it's an app for a smartphone, an <coughs> Android device, or iOS um, operating uh, system that allows for basically tracking of the bus. Um, it would you know, let you know where the bus is in relation to your stop, uh, the expected arrival time, and, and those sorts of things. Yes. Again, very valuable for um, during times of inclement weather, uh, during the first couple of weeks of, of, of the school year where there's always that feeling out stage of, okay, are they gonna come five minutes early, five minutes later than before? Um, so it, it, there is a, a good value um, in it, uh, but it is an additional cost. I would make a motion we add it right now. I think Mrs. Reed was the one who brought that to attention. I, I don't see why we wouldn't get that because people wait for buses, the bus is late, and you're, you're a nervous wreck. And I don't think really 12,000 plus 5,000, it's about 17,000 if you get that. Mm -hmm. I would make a motion we. But didn't you say we could get it on our own? No, well, the, the software is something we will have to do on our own. Oh, okay. okay. Which is um, 5,000. Yeah. Yeah. 12,000 plus 5. Exactly. Yeah. I make, go, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to add to Mrs. Cavallo's point one question, which was, is there any, I'm, I'm going to, I'll say this in, in terms of a, of a guess. I'm guessing that if we waited till a later time and didn't do it tonight, there's not that good of a chance that the price is going to get any better. Uh, is that no, fair to say? I think I received their final offer. Yeah, so so they took the a piece right. of it off. So we're looking at about twelve grand a year for the app and five thousand for the software, which we do on our own, separate from the bus. And the software is one shot once you buy. It. Uh, it, no, it's a it, the way that so, the software business is nowadays. It's a recurring it's a, fee. <laughs> okay, so it's going to be it's hosted. So it's going to be twelve thousand, seventeen thousand every year. Every year. Yes. Well, I make a motion that we instruct the. Finance director to add that into the pluses. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Go ahead, Greg. Just a, maybe a foolish question, but it's a free app for the parents. Right? Yes, there, there's okay. no charge for the parents. We have a discussion. Yeah. <laughs> right, let's get used to it, and then, we'll, then once we love it, then they'll charge us. Right. <laughs> One year free subscription. <laughs> so saying no discussion, all in favor? Motion carries, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, the last business uh, piece of business I have before the committee, um, <coughs> again, involves school buses. Um, as the committee is aware, um, the district uh, needs to replace the, its current uh, big yellow bus. Um, the uh, vehicle is a 2007 model. Um, it has over 184,600 miles on it. 
I believe it has served the district well, and I believe the district has, has gotten every penny out of it. Um, the request uh, for this uh, dates back to when I started here, uh, which was uh, just short of three years ago, um, and it made the FY17 budget only to be removed immediately at, at the next meeting. Um, however, given uh, where we stand with our E&D fund, even with the uh, proposed increase um, for FY19, I think this is something that we, that we have to do. Uh, so my recommendation to the committee is that you um, vote to approve a budget amendment of $115,000. Um, the school bus is slated to cost around $85,000. There are a couple of options that we would like to include in there, such as storage underneath. Um, and obviously making sure that we have a camera and, and all of those um, safety items. Um, this would allow for any fluctuations in the bid um, to come in, and if that money was not used uh, for the big yellow bus, then I would propose that we look at buying either a new, but most likely um, used uh, van or vans um, as, as money is available. Uh, and those, those um, student transportation vans help to offset the expenses uh, for student activities and, and most importantly athletics um, where they go out and, and procure you know for a student to, to bring them um, someplace so you know we, uh, I think it's a something that will generate cost savings um, over time for the so district. So I'll entertain a motion to approve uh, the budget amend amendment in the amount of $115,000 which will not ch increase our assessments. It will be taking out, out of excess in the deficiency fund. Okay, I'll we'll entertain a motion to approve. Second. Any discussion, Elaine? Um, just through the chair, I know that you're pursuing, Mr. Vesto is pursuing through Senator Fatman the possibility of getting um, funding for the bus through a budget amendment at the state level. If that were to go through and be approved, and we've spent this money from our E and D fund, would anything coming in from the state then return to E and D? So, the answer to that is that that the bus. I made two requests to Senator Fatman on behalf of the district. One was the bus, mm -hmm. and then subsequent to that was the generator at Shepherd Hill. The bus is off the table. Okay. The generator is still on the table, very much on the table, okay. and that's the more expensive of the two. So yeah, that's that's not something that we so can we won't be point. looking forward to no. get any money from the no. state for the bus. Okay. okay. Any other discussion? Just a follow-up question. I know when we discussed this at budget and finance, I had had um, advocated on behalf of adding to the <coughs> request to do a smaller van for transportation to allow for specifically we have very small teams that go out to do that. I think it's beneficial for um, schools to be able to have a transportation piece if they want to do a small field trip. We would go out into the community, bring kids out, and then to increase the opportunities at the high school for students that are going out on, on jo job co-op so that we have an ability to go to more than one location. So I'm hoping that we can, we can manage both of those functions within this amendment. Any other? Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion carries. It's unanimous, Sandy. This is a point, if I may. Th first of all, thank you for that vote. And I just want to say, make sure that it's clear. This is an upfront cost that the committee has committed to, but it's a it's a cost savings in the long run, mm -hmm. and it doesn't take too long. When you think about each trip, is costing us between three fifty and five hundred, six hundred dollars. It's not too long before we, re we recoup that money by not having to contract out on this. So, yeah, uh, very. I want to make sure that we're clear on that to the public. Mm -hmm. We also have the custodians that are all trained bus drivers, right. aren't they? Yes. So that saves it on that too. Yep, exactly. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, this, this is a, a big step forward um, for the district. Um, just making sure that we still have that reliable transportation. It, it, you know. Going, going to inspection time will not be as nerve-wracking <laughs> anymore. But we do intend to keep to run this uh, other bus on <coughs> the ground, literally. So you know, we'll keep doing repairs. We'll keep it up and running as long as the state allows us to. Uh, that's, no that's, you know, that's a good thought. That's, that's interesting. It sounds like it. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Next item, warrant signing procedure. Um, this is Modesto. Uh, Mrs. O'Coin, if it's okay, I'm going to uh, turn this one over to Mr. Matthew, who spent a good portion of time with um, our treasurer, Melinda Ernst Fournier. Uh, we also utilized some examples from other districts uh, in putting together what you have before you tonight. Uh, so with that, if it's okay with you, Mrs. O'Coin, I'll turn it over to Mr. Matthew right. to uh, explain. And I have a question for Mr. Matthew. Sure. Did we schedule yet? Um, in case the committee wants to meet with uh, Melinda? Uh, we proposed March 3rd? March 2nd. 2nd. Time? Uh, 3 p.m. Okay. It's a Friday. Yes. Yeah, the third would have been bad. You could have been there, Mr. Desto. I, I would have <laughs> been there. Um, so the um, procedure that you have in front of you basically just modifies um, the process that we're currently following. Uh, the, the, the committee had uh, previously voted in a, um, established a subcommittee of three members um, for the purpose of signing warrants to allow checks to, to be done out, um, and processed outside of the regular meeting. Um, this, this draft uh, in front of you was taken uh, from another regional school district um, with just our specifications kind of uh, worked into there. Um, I, I think it, it makes sense to codify this. I think really the, the only change for uh, the committee will be uh, that we'll, we'll be very clear about bringing each and every warrant um, to the meetings and making sure that everybody has a chance to review them. Uh, as the committee you know, had requested a couple of years ago, we have been emailing out the, the warrants ahead of time uh, for review. Um, pursuant to um, committee members' requests, we, we will have the warrants available uh, for signature <coughs> here prior to the meeting uh, and for review, um, and certainly afterwards as well um, uh, on any given night. Um, so, you know, People don't need to take the time during the meeting necessarily to sign, to sign and, and pass them uh, back and forth. Um, we did include in here um, the uh, concept of having an alternative member of the subcommittee in case uh, a signature um, may, may, be, uh, may present a conflict of interest for somebody. Um, and I think that it simply makes sense to codify that ahead of time rather than run into the situation later. Should we put that right in there, fourth member? Will be playing as an alternate to resolve. Actually, put the word alternate in there because it almost sounds like there'll be four no. members all the time. Uh, I would put alternate. Point point yeah. as an alternate. Will be appointed okay. as an alternate to resolve any other term. And I would point the, word the alternate yeah. whoever would like to be an alternate. It'll be anyone. I'm already on. <laughs> Stephanie's on already. Alternate. Debbie, Elaine, do you want to be the alternate, or Mary, or Joe, Ray? Uh, we'll I, be I, alternate. I can be the alternate. Okay, thank you. And I did tell um, Dawn to, um, if there's payroll, that to mark it, so I'll make sure I won't sign, and that's when we need the alternate. And that's usually... The, usually the payroll's at the <coughs> meeting, but if we need it on and off, you'll be called for that. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. All right. I, I don't know if there are any specific questions on what you see in, uh, in front of you. Uh, if you need us more time to review. Or? It seems fine. Any, any questions on that? Question, just on the timing, oh, are we looking at having the agenda change our agenda so that the warrant isn't within the meeting or are we going to move it towards the end of the meeting I, I would actually make the recommendation that the agenda list the warrant numbers um, that uh, are before the committee for approval again it doesn't need to be an item that is done within the, the meeting itself okay. um, but I think it makes sense to leave it on the uh, agenda as is I uh, uh, again, with the inclusion yeah. of the warrant numbers. It's going to be time to, to break habits so that we're not, as I was signing warrants during the meeting tonight, which I, I know that was something that I had brought up that was disturbing to me because I find it very distracting. Mm -hmm. Could we sign it at the beginning or at the end? Uh, again, the warrants are, are here uh, ahead of They're time. Here. 
and, and, so and we'll, tr we'll try to make sure that we establish a, a practice of being you know 15 minutes or 20 minutes ahead of the meeting and uh, again, I think Mrs. Rabbit's point well. is on the agenda is an item up there number four maybe it should right. be moved out of there completely and put it at the end uh, uh, because that seems like we should be doing it not if we're not going to do number four it should be up at number four no you know I mean? but we should have it on the it be agenda you should have I the warrant the because you have to announce that sure. there is a warrant exactly being signed. Yeah. I put it at the end signed. after new business because by then we're done because at the beginning, if we at the beginning, then we might start the meeting late. So great, mm -hmm. I put it at the end. Okay, so that we want to put that after new business starting in the next yeah. meeting. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. <coughs> and Mrs. O'Connor, I just have one more Go question. Um, just in reviewing the the proposal and some of the material that was passed out at our last meeting with other policies, I I think the one that I'm still um, interested in people's opinion and looking to include is was part of the um, proposal that is used in Wachusett that um, specifies that any new members to the school committee would need to be trained within 30 days in order to be signing warrants and I think that that would be important moving forward um, we're doing an initial training here but every year you know, if there were new members selected, I think that they should be trained before they their signing warrants. Don't they, that have, is, don't they have to go to the MASC training? Is that included in that or no? No, this is this is basically the the point, and this came from the Mars training that Mary and I attended. Is that warrant training should be coming from the from the um, district's treasurer um, on the warrant signing process? So that would be in house training that we do. <coughs> It sounds like any new members must be trained within 30 days before they're allowed to sign the warrant. That would cover it. Right. So the, the, the language is in the one right. policy. So we have a procedure. Okay. And we'll go by that. All right. Cyber security information. Mrs. Antoshi and Mrs. Rabbit. Mary. Uh, Mrs. Rabbit and I attended a Mask Division 5 presenta four presentation on cybersecurity, specifically as it relates to the school environment. And we came back with a lot of concerns because um, this is something that is hitting us in our backyards. It's not something that is far away. It, it hit two schools right nearby, and it happens every day. Um, what is happening um, was um, addressed by one presenter initially, Blue Hills Regional Vocational High School, where they experienced a DDoS attack, it's called, a distributed denial of service. And they repeatedly got attacked where over a five week period, their systems were inaccessible. And what happened was, it would shut down their internet for 30 to 60 minutes per day um, per attack and the source of the system problems are really difficult to pinpoint. Ultimately it turned out to be a disgruntled parent that, that started this attack. Um, but what, what, what became very clear to them is how easy it is to start these attacks on the systems and also how little help they would get from their internet provider when something did happen and how ill-prepared they were to handle it. So basically, um, DDoS attacks can be purchased um, on the dark web with bitcoins. So um, this parent just purchased bitcoins and attacked them multiple times and took down their financial systems, their daily operations, their payroll systems, their warrants, um, it attacked their cloud services. It can also attack their student and employee information systems, um, teacher lesson plans that teachers put together for hours and hours and years on end. Um, it can address the one-to-one -one computing systems like all of Chromebooks, MCAS 2.0 testing, um, virtually every aspect of the <coughs> school community and it's really, really hard to track it down. And, and one of the other schools that um, was hit by it was our neighbor next door, which was Bay Path. 
and fortunately for them, they were attacked in July. So there weren't any students there, but first one computer wasn't working, then the next computer wasn't working, then they couldn't do payroll, then they couldn't work on the budgets. So all of their, all of their data for three months was lost. And they actually had to go out and hire a data scrubbing vendor to take the data away, scrub it, and, and give it back to them. So each of these, each of these schools went from spending two or three hundred dollars a month for their internet service providers to like twenty-five thousand dollars a year just for a service to monitor all of this stuff. <coughs> um, one of the other things that that became um, very apparent was how many different ways you can be attacked. So it's not only DDoS attacks; it's things like. Um, it's things like um, when emails, yes, it comes in through emails, it can come in through flash drives, it come, can come in through guest networks. So somebody can just come into your, your school and log in into your guest network and all of a sudden they've implemented an attack on, on the system. So, um, we walked away with a lot of concerns and, and a lot of recommendations from the two presenters from the schools and also from the vendors that mitigate these types of cyber attacks. And we put it all together in this memo that hopefully everybody has. Um, but initially we wanted to bring it to your attention not only because it is of concern but also to f try to understand what do we have in place here at the district now what should we be looking at? Are we protected? How well are we protected? And what, we sh what should we, do we be doing for next steps? Additionally, if we need to put something in place, this is a cost. So it's a budget impact. So we should be looking at it now because we're in budget season. Where would we put such costs if in fact we need to implement something? So I was hoping that perhaps um, our technology <laughs> do do would, would, would join us and, and help us understand a little bit about sure. what right. we have in place today and if we need to be concerned. Yeah. Well, Mr. Darkangelo is stepping up. I think just to hit, hit the numbers, um, this caught our attention because when Blue Hills was attacked with the DDoS attack, they ended up needing to spend $100,000 to mitigate their issue. And a $100,000 hit, as we've experienced this year with the generator, a $100,000 hit once your budget is established and we're going through the school year is money we don't have. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that the message that had come down really loud and clear to us was <coughs> that it was more to our advantage to be proactive, to be ahead of problems than to be responding to attacks. So. Okay. So the answer man is here. It looks like um, the two that you're talking about, one was a DDoS attack, one was uh, ransomware. Ransomware. Believe, right? ransomware. So that's a thing. I, I, yes. Yeah. I just want to say that. That's yeah. a so thing. I mean, two, thing. two yeah. totally different things. Um, and like you said, there, there are plenty of ways to be attacked. Um, this is what we look at pretty much all, most of the day, every day. Um, there's, you know, if you talk about the guest networks, um, Guest networks are completely isolated from the production network, so no one can get onto it. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, though, they you know can obviously suck up a lot of bandwidth if you have you know in our case probably close to three thousand guest machines. Um, if any one of them are compromised or they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, you know it could generate a lot of traffic. It's not going to impact. Well, it's not going to um, be a security issue to our production stuff, but it could use it that bandwidth. Um, as far as ransomware goes, um, there's only really one way to combat ransomware is just have good backups, you know, have a good backup solution. Um, so the backup solution we have, it's kind of um, like a multi-level one. We basically have um, a week's worth of daily backups on site, three months worth of daily backups at a different location. Then we have quarterly backups um, at another location. We have that going back about three years right now. And then we have at a uh, fourth and final location 
uh, the last four quarterly backups as well as an annual backup. So that goes back about four years now. So um, pretty much you just want to make sure you don't have all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. I know at Bay Bath they have one location. So offsite for Bay Bath is in the cloud somewhere. Mm -hmm. For us, we have seven locations. So one of the few nice things about having to deal with a network in seven locations is your offsite is still technically on site, you know, so you're still managing that stuff. Um, so that's how we handle the backups and you know quarterly when we go to make the quarterly backups, um, we test those out, you know, every couple of months we'll test out backups just randomly just to make sure that you know we're able to restore stuff and whatnot. Um, knock on wood so far we've had no issues with things that we've had to restore. Uh, we've had to restore plenty of things. Um, whether it's somebody deleting stuff or, or whatnot. We did get hit as well um, with ransomware about a year and a half ago, roughly, something like that, um, where came into email, you know, the user really, really worked to get to it, and, um, you know, it was already already quarantined, the spam and everything else. Uh, I clicked on it, and basically their computer was completely encrypted, and any uh, network share that they had access to was encrypted. So this is why we minimize um, what everybody sees. There were different drive maps, so they didn't have access to the whole thing. It was just two, uh, two shared folders. We restored the backup from the night before at six o'clock, and um, basically there were three files that had been changed between that time and the time when this happened. All three files were changed by the same person that clicked on it. So um, they lost about 10 minutes worth of work total. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we had to take down that machine, repair it, uh, and then put it back out, but um, you know, between viruses, DOS attacks, um, <coughs> anything. I mean, you hear stuff all the time with malware attacks and botnets and whatnot. It's, um, it's just a lot of stuff that, you know, this is why you have to really monitor what you have. So I, I know what the, um, you know, speaking about the DOS attacks, there's really no way to combat, well, there's no way to prevent those. If somebody wants to take you down, they're going to try to take you down. Um, the whole point of it is they're not getting into your network, you're trying to keep them out of the network but they're basically filling your internet bandwidth. So they have way more bandwidth than anybody else does. Because if you're talking about a DDoS attack, you have, you have thousands of machines that are infected with malware, um, and it's just a, a targeted attack by all of them. They're gonna have more combined bandwidth than we're gonna have. Um, so if they fill that pipe, you just don't get out anywhere. Most DOS attacks, though, um, are targeted towards web servers. We don't have any uh, public-facing web servers. So, you know, as far as um, the student information system, uh, you know, our email system, which obviously is G Suite, um, eSped, all those are hosted sites, even our district website. It's hosted by the vendors. We pay the vendors a large amount of money to host these sites. It doesn't really cost a lot to host things. The money comes into play when things happen and, you know, they have to make sure that you can get to that website. Um, so they're dealing with all of the mitigation issues, you know, in that respect. It is possible that you know someone could attack just our um, our IP address for here, you know, our external gateway, um, you know. But there's really not much of a reason to, because again, we're not hosting any of these websites there. So, um, if that were to happen, though, I know you had Sophos, I believe you had Sophos there at that meeting, um, and they probably spoke about things like uh, unified threat management systems and whatnot. Um, so, for the last seven years, we've had two. Um, Two of their top of the line um, SG650s is our firewall slash uh, UTMs. So that mitigates, um, you know, DOS attacks, um, scans for viruses, for everything that comes in and out. We also have antivirus on all of our machines, anyways. Um, you know, it's um, active threat management. It's you know intrusion prevention. It's all built into that. Um, so we've been running that, and like I would haven't had any major issues. Uh, it's also a lot of content filtering, so you know, and uh, bandwidth shaping. So, um, right now we're probably we're paying a good chunk of money for those two devices. We do get a lot back. Um, I know you heard about the you know the rate reimbursement is about one hundred thirty-three thousand. So all that E-rate reimbursement is strictly the connectivity between locations, the two internet connections, and the two firewalls. Um, so we're getting one hundred thirty-three thousand back. 60 percent you can see how much it costs to, uh, to keep that going we're talking well over a quarter of a million dollars just for network connectivity before you rate reimbursement hopefully that doesn't go away anytime soon but with the way things are going with the FCC and whatnot I guess as good as mine um, 
through, through the chair. So, Dan, do you think the district is adequately um, protected at this point? I think we're protected well for a um, school district that's dead last and spending regional wise. And, I mean, it is what it is. I hate to say it that way, but um, you know, I mean, if we're looking for a Cisco or a three com type solution, you're not going to get it with what we're spending. Um, that being said, I've had a lot of vendors come out, you know, doing walkthroughs for um, for wiring jobs and whatnot. And when they walk through and look at what we have here, I mean, other than some of the closets being literally maintenance janitor closets with switches in them and whatnot, they look at what we're doing here and they're like, "Wow, we've seen so much worse." Um, so, I mean, are we at the top? No. Are we at the bottom? No, we're close. But you know, we're probably sitting as well as you can sit as far as we're able to spend, so. Dan, can I ask a question? In, 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 I've told you on many occasions that this goes way over my head, so mm -hmm. be kind. Um, <laughs> one, the IT director from Blue Hills recommended a software called Wireshark mm -hmm. that monitors the activity. Do we have something similar to that? Yeah, Wireshark is open source, so it's, okay. um, you know, I, I use it for troubleshooting purposes, not to monitor all activity at all times. Okay. Our hive manager that controls the uh, access points and um, our Sophos uh, ETMs that I was speaking about earlier, those monitor all the traffic coming in and out. So whether it's an attack that's generated or you know, originates from behind our firewall or from the internet, um, you can see, you get a lot of information off of that. I use Wireshark strictly as um, you know, troubleshooting purposes. Okay. Running it the entire time doesn't make any sense. We're already looking at <laughs> multiple um, systems that do the same thing. Okay. So one of the other things that they talked about from Blue Hills was the E-rate funding, which would include firewall services. So that's what you're saying we're already currently getting reimbursement from for the self, the SOFOS equipment? Yeah, we actually go through Integrity by CELT uh, for the two firewalls, and we bundle it with um, our two one gig internet connections through that. They're basically Charter Spectrum connections. But by bundling it through them, we're able to get the firewalls for um, they're eligible for E-rate. If you don't bundle that, your firewalls are not eligible for E-rate. Okay. Category so one. Our internet provider is Charter. Correct. Okay. On on one of the other things that came through that um, they talked about also, um, has Acuity come out to visit us at all? Uh, way back, probably about. I got here about 10 years ago. Okay. Um, they they hired them to do a couple of things. Okay. We haven't asked them back. No, I just, yeah. <laughs> that says it all. No, the, <laughs> the, the, I know they're, they're an Auburn company, but the gentleman that is there is also a school committee member, so mm -hmm. from a, a local school district. So um, he was there, but one of the points that he made was in relation to the sensitive data that's on hard drives of copiers and scanners and things like that. And I know that we do go through times where we're dispersing old equipment and they talked about making sure that those things are removed <coughs> and shredded. Um, is that a normal part of our process that we do when we're um, disposing of old equipment? Not so much with the coffee machines because I don't do anything with disposing of coffee machines, but with the hard drives on, on the computers, we run them through a wipe first and then when the uh, recycle company comes out, we have them destroy the drives as well. Okay. I don't like to put them out there without at least wiping them with one pass anyways. So. Okay. So with the copiers, um, and I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll look to Mr. Matthew about <coughs> just if we're doing anything with copiers coming in and out, they, that I know is something where people going through, especially personnel <coughs> records, student records, the sitting on that machine, I don't know if that has to be something that we consider when those pieces of equipment are going in and out, that that information actually stays on the hard drive within the copier. So if we've leased it and it leaves everything that's been copied, can be taken off of that machine when it's turned in. Um, through the, if I get it. Um, the uh, contract with RICO when we do when we do turn the machines back to them um, calls for them to clean that drive. So that, that is that is supposed to be happening. We don't physically remove the drive and destroy it ourselves, though. Okay. It sounds like though now we're in pretty good shape. <laughs> shape would be. Yeah, we spend. We spend a lot of time on it, unfortunately. It's not something we really want to spend a lot of time on. Um, right. But 
It is what it is. I mean, you, there are, there's a bunch of things that can be done in addition to what we've been doing um, to really tighten things up. If I get to the point where we're really tightening, tightening things up, you're probably not doing much with the equipment at that point. I mean, we can disable it so you can't plug in flash drives. We can, you know, we can do all this stuff. Yeah, um, that's not good yeah. because of kids. It gets to the point where, you know, we um, try to make sure they can use the equipment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have that fine line that you have to kind of, you know, dance around, but if you tighten it up too much, it gets to the point where, you know, I mean, a, a few things. They're not getting use out of yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, a few things obviously <laughs> make sense. Uh, we tried a long time ago, it was yeah. five, six that's years ago, we tried to block um, all <coughs> email except for our email. There's really no reason to you check your personal email when you're at work when you're on your cell phone or whatever. But email is the single largest place where you're going to get that mm -hmm. you know a lot of infections. So um, obviously if you have twenty email systems that you can check, you know, it's a bigger chance than one. So we tried that a while ago but it, you know way too many complaints. Too many complaints is it? Yeah. So is there anything that you would recommend that we did in addition to what we're doing now? Well, I mean, it's just keep doing what we're doing right now. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, they're, they're talking about 100,000 to, to mitigate, um, you know, issues if you have DOS attacks. Like I said, the I mean, I believe those firewalls and the internet connections right now are about 146,000 a year. Um, obviously, after you rate it's down to <coughs> whatever it is around 70 or something like that. So, um, you know. Do we need to spend a, a time more on it? No, I mean, it is stuff that we should really, you know, keep looking at. And we're always tweaking stuff, making sure that, you know, if there's, um, you know, additional tools we can use or whatnot or different uh, subscriptions on the firewalls. Um, there's always things you can do, but you can come up with a plan tomorrow and it's posed a week later because they've come out with 15 other ways to do it. So, um, you know, we do have the screen locks in place where, you know, people walk away from their machines after 20 minutes, they automatically <coughs> lock. For the first 20 minutes, it's on them. You know, if you leave the machine unlocked, anybody can get into your email or anything else. Um, unfortunately, the biggest issue, whether it's our school district, another school district, a company, it doesn't really matter. The biggest threat to security is, has always been and always will be users. <laughs> is what it is. Um, so, Training, yeah, training is a big thing. Rich? I, I was just going to ask Mr. <laughs> Dr. Angelo that exact question. What's okay. the biggest threat to the system? Because he and I have spoken about it before. I can lock down everything else, but if someone's going to do something foolish, um, mm -hmm. it's going to be issues. Go ahead. I just have a question. Uh, when I heard about the $100,000 unexpected cost at Blue Hills, I thought about insurance and what, what What's insured? I mean, it, you know, when these, when these kinds of things happen, are we just out of luck? Or well, we actually had someone come in. Um, I can't remember that. Available for mine. Yeah, I can remember who, the, who it was that the bank came in. But basically, yeah, you can get insurance um, to cover things like, you know, if you got ransomware or whatnot. But, you know, we talked about it. And, um, you know, realistically, it's kind of like if your house catches on fire, you lose all your pictures. You get insurance money, you're not getting your pictures back. Right. Same thing with your files. You can get money for it, but you're not getting your files back. The uh, money from the insurance company will go a long way, obviously, towards if there was a lawsuit because you've lost something. Um, if you cover that, you're still not getting your files back unless you have backups. Um, so, you know, I really can't say, I guess, if it's worth insurance or paying insurance or not for that. That's above me. You answered the you proposed the question of the, the next one that I was going to ask, and I think this came up with the um, with uh, the IT director over at Baypath, um, who recommended that we look at the insurance possibility. In in Baypath's case, it was because of the lost production time, so they needed to rebuild. They one they were shut down for three days; they couldn't do anything. And then they had to go through and rebuild. So I agree with you that you, to some degree, can't retrieve your files, but there at least is some reimbursement for the costs of the what you incur for reestablishing uh, functionality with it. So it might be something to just ask the question as to what insurance would be and what it would cost, and if there's any benefit to it, um, if it's something that we should consider that we don't have. Um, again. Similar to buying life insurance, sometimes it's better to buy it when 
you, you don't need it and things are healthy than when you have to go buy it after something happened. So it, at least it's information that I think we should, you know, um, just make a fresh look at. Well, you made me feel better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very helpful. It sounds like we're in good shape. <laughs> that was helpful. Thank you. It was yeah. helpful. Yeah. It's frightening to think about this. It is. Well, thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. That made us feel a lot better. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that. It would have been helpful to see a bit at the meeting. We wouldn't have panicked. <laughs> <laughs> it's panic. You're worried all that for nothing. Because it's a new for us anyway. It's not for Mr. Doc For us, it's a new frontier. Yeah. It's, it's un yeah. unknown and it's, it's, there's no face to it. It's yeah. Well, they said there's over 400,000 new malware. Every single day. That's yeah. unbelievable. Seventy-five percent of which is targeted to that one entity that they're going after. So the bad guys not asleep. Well, what they what they turned around and said was that we're basically things like public school systems, municipalities, we're kind of the the um, bottom fruit because so much corporate sabotage has been addressed that they're going for lower level fruit because we haven't been thinking about it. So you know. Um, in the case of um, Bay Path, it was one thing, but really the DDoS attack and the, uh, I'm just stopping to think of how many people and having a system of, you know, 4,000 students and 500 staff, you know, there has to be some disgruntled person somewhere along the line each week, and their attack came from a parent. <coughs> they said 7.58 every morning was the first attack every morning for five weeks at 7.58, and they turned off at the end of the school day. So it's, it's hopefully we're not giving anybody any ideas. If you have a problem or complaint, please call us. <laughs> they, they also talked about some manual procedures that can be put in place. With, I mean, people, it, users are the worst offenders, of course, you know, so, you know, you walk away from your desk and you have personnel files on your desk, or you have student information on your desk, or that email that, that you just received from somebody about something to do with a, a SPED file or something, and you leave to have lunch or go get a coffee and it's sitting there on your desk and anyone can kind of walk by and see that stuff. These are all vulnerabilities that we, we need to take care of procedurally and think about. Okay, we'll go on now to um, our last item, consideration of requests for non-resident enrollment policy, JM, Mr. Desto. Thank you, Mrs. O'Coin. I, I do only have one request for the committee tonight, um, and it is the first one that appears in your package. Uh, uh, a parent has requested that her daughter be allowed to complete the eighth grade within the district, within the school that she's currently in. Um, this particular uh, family had to move out of the district citing safety concerns. So it's, in my opinion, clearly in the best interest of the student, and I recommend your approval that she finish the year within the district. Okay, I'll entertain a motion so for moved. approval. Second. Discussion? Seeing none all in favor? Motion carries. It's unanimous. Thank you. Next meeting dates. School committee meetings, Wednesday, February 28th. That will be at the Charlton Middle School, 7 p.m. Wednesday, March 14th. That will be at Shepherd Hill Regional High School at 7 p.m. And that's the evening of our public hearing for our budget. And budget and finance subcommittee to be announced. Future agenda items, budget administrator's budget presentation, MSBA update, strategic planning update. Elaine had one. Um, um, did you, Elaine? Uh, the parent app. Yeah, the parent the, app. The parent yeah. app. Okay, put that. Yeah, but that's all. Oh, we already voted. Yeah. Yeah. No, we already, we already, we already voted on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, but, um, and then we already solved the agenda item. We're going to put that at the okay. end. The yeah. no. um, or what is what is your thoughts on um, convening the budget and finance subcommittee? I was going to recommend uh, to the to everybody later um, either March first uh, 
sixth or eighth, right? we get a meeting in between the February twenty eighth regular meeting and the next and the public hearing on the fourteenth. Uh, and you know, for me, the sooner the better. But, and I'm just those are three dates that work really well for me. But I'll obviously adjust to your schedule. Yeah. First, it's supposed to be a Thursday. It's Thursday. I think the first. Is a, the first is a Thursday. Yeah. Yep. I, I can't do that one. Okay. okay. The sixth is a Tuesday, and the eighth is a um, Thursday. Thursday. Six is best for me. How about you guys? I can do the sixth. Whatever. I'll, yeah, I'll take it, and if it's an issue, I'll figure it out. Well, it can change. Okay, so um, March sixth. We'll, we'll announce March sixth at the district office at nine a.m. Okay. okay, so it's March sixth at the district office at nine a.m. And any other agenda items? Well, we'll have continued discussions on on override, like okay. override, but that's kind of already but right. That goes without saying. And we'll add to it. Uh, okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? We're adjourned.